And so our journey, well, our, our journey through electric and uh, magnetic fields is near its end. I'm sorry. It's a shame. It's a shame that it all comes down to this. Uh, so, yeah, we're essentially done with uh, dealing with the electric and magnetic fields. Um, so, okay, I don't know exactly where I'm going with this lecture, but that's okay. We're, we'll, we'll, we'll muddle through it. Um, the, the issue is, is that, uh, well, you know my affinity for people that come in and state the obvious. Right? I mean, we have Kirchhoff's laws and, you know, like, you know, state the obvious and, and that kind of thing. Um, Maxwell, I guess you could probably say, is another one of these situations where Maxwell walks in and states the obvious to a degree. So I'll give him a little more credit. Uh, so this is James Clerk Maxwell. We're in the 18, ah, shoot, I want to say like 1880s, something, something around that line. And uh, so please remember that in, in this, this conversation, this whole thing, there's a bunch of people working simultaneously on stuff. And in fact, we could go through and start name dropping because you have Coulomb's law. Um, Coulomb's law gives you the idea about the electric field and the charges. And then I didn't mention this personality. You don't need to know this personality, but I'll name drop them just in case. And I'll write down an equation here that, again, you don't need to know, but will hopefully make a little more sense now that we've gone through this idea of flux. Okay. But there's, uh, there's this gentleman by the name of Carl Frederick Gauss. I don't know if that name rings a bell or not, but Carl Frederick Gauss was a mathematician and scientist who also was working on some of these ideas. Now, his came from more of a mathematical side, in the sense of he was looking at the mathematics of vector fields. So he was looking at what, what kind of mathematical properties do vector fields have, which is in, intimately tied to this subject of physical vector fields, the electric field and the magnetic field. So uh, now, Carl Frederick Gauss, I think he's credited not with inventing into what's called vector calculus. And doing calculus with vectors, and usually that's known as Cal three nowadays. And so he comes into play in this story as well. Um, then you have Bio Savoy, who studies and quantifies the relationship that moving charges create magnetic. So you've got stationary charges generate electric fields, moving charges. And you go through, um, there's another personality associated with Theo Savar, again, I skipped over it, but that, I mean, I'll give it to you, I'll name drop it here, is Ampere. Ampere took the idea from, took some ideas from Carl Frederick Gauss and applied them to the magnetic field to find some relations, and that's today known as Ampere's Law, which, again, we completely skipped over. Then Faraday comes along and says, well, if moving charges can create magnetic fields, maybe magnetic fields can create charges. And that's the one we did skip over, right? Faraday's law is the one that I said, okay, no, you absolutely need to know that one because that's what keeps the lights on. It's, and it has a lot of applications in everyday life. So I said, no, we have to do that one. So th that, that's kind of where we leave things. Changing magnetic fields can drive currents. Okay. Wait a minute. And so it feels like a very cyclic loop. He goes, wait, wait a minute. So Faraday's law says creates a difference in potential. This is nothing new. Or if you want to look at it a different way, you could say a change in flux generates an electric field. Right, if you have a difference of potential, there's an electric field being generated. So Faraday goes, well, wait a minute. So essentially a changing right, an electric field. Maybe a changing electric field can generate a magnetic field. Um, so Faraday looks at Bio Savar and says, currents generate magnetic fields, maybe magnetic fields can generate currents. 
And then Maxwell basically says, well, if changing magnetic Except instead of looking at the changing magnetic flux, he looks at the changing electric flux. And that today is known as what's called Maxwell's correction. Um, you do not need to know this. I'm just putting up there for, for kind of uh, conceptual purposes. So you don't need to know this equation. You're not going to need to apply this equation. But you can kind of see, at least on this right-hand side, what's going on. We've dealt a lot with the changing magnetic flux. Maxwell writes down a changing electric flux. You know what mu naught and epsilon naught are. Those come in very suspiciously. And on the, the left-hand side, he doesn't call it an EMF. He doesn't call it, uh, uh, what would it be called? An MMF, a magnetic motive force? You know, whatever that is, I, I don't know. Um, he writes it more in terms of the magnetic field. So pun not intended, Maxwell gets a lot of credit for closing the loop, for recognizing that there is a piece in this entire theory that's missing. And so you can, and again, everybody's working on these simultaneously. So Maxwell gets credit for recognizing that there's a missing piece, and he actually gives us what the missing piece is. Uh, correction. We call it the Maxwell correction because this, this piece is generally tacked on to Ampere's law. So Ampere came up with a, an idea about um, uh, uh, shortcuts, currents, and magnetic fields, similar to Vio Savar. Uh, Maxwell came in and said, that's the right idea. This is just an extra piece that you were missing. Now that piece, I, I say, Maxwell, I think gets a lot of credit for a lot of the work because these four equations that I have not given to you are collectively known as Maxwell's equations, which for better or for worse is, is what they're known as. Even though two of them were proposed by Gauss, one of them was proposed by Faraday, and half of one was proposed by Ampere. Nonetheless, Maxwell comes in, puts this term on, and everything's known as Maxwell's equations nowadays. Sometimes life doesn't seem fair, so I, I, I fault him for that. And that's essentially the status of electromagnetic theory in the 1880s or so, which is the same electromagnetic theory that you learn today, which is the same electromagnetic theory that you would learn for two classes past this one. Uh, so you basically have everything that you need to know in order to understand electromagnetic theory. It just, the math gets harder. That's essentially, literally when I walked into the grad level class that covers this stuff, that's, essential, that's exactly what the professor said. Paraphrase was, you know everything that you need to know. The math gets harder. So instead of dealing with spheres, you don't get to deal with eggs. You know, like that, those kind of things. Instead of doing a 1D circle, you get to do a sphere, and then we get to go from a, that's like the 300 level class going from circles to spheres. And then the 600 level class is going from spheres to eggs. Yeah. Okay. This piece is really important now. Uh, so again, why is Greg telling me this? Uh, that piece, at least you need to conceptually know that it's there. Because that piece, this piece is the final uh, nail in the coffin that gives us a better understanding of what light is. Or you sometimes know light as, instead of calling it light, you call it a electromagnetic wave. Let's, let's latch on to that. Let's latch on to the idea. You've probably heard the term that light is an electromagnetic wave, or you've heard electromagnetic spectrum. We need this piece in order to think about the electromagnetic spectrum. So let's start with this. Uh, okay, I don't know how this is going to go, so we'll we'll just we'll play it by ear. 
Uh, let's start. You want to start off with the B field? Let's start off with the B field, right, a magnetic field. Now, use the term wave. Usually, we, you know, wave, I'll draw a wave in. Okay. So, I don't know if this, okay, let's see if actually if I look at it, if I can draw it better. Okay, so I got a straight line here, and I will draw the magnetic wave. So, I'm going to literally draw a wave. Oh, it looks so nice. I should sit down all the time. Do not sit here. There, I should sit down all the time with this. Do they all rock like that? What is this? You guys are pampered. Nice. Yeah. Oh, I, I mean, you guys already know you're pampered because I used to have to do this in an unair conditioned building. Right. Can you imagine doing this stuff at 2.30 in the afternoon when it's 80 degrees outside? You know, oh, yeah, it's springtime and you have the windows opening. The, the... I find the most uncomfortable chair. That's all I have to say. Okay, uh, so now uh, I should, uh, we'll walk through it, but okay, I've drawn a wave. What we really mean by this representation is the distance of the wave is supposed to be indicative of the magnitude of the magnetic field. Right. And spatially, what we're trying to represent is how the magnetic field varies as we move in space. So places where you see a large ample, you know, the the large distance, that's a high magnetic field strength and zero magnetic field strength and a low, you know. Is that OK so far? Now, the second thing, what do waves do? They, they travel, they propagate. Right? So imagine this for a second. Imagine this wave. I've drawn just a small piece of it, but imagine that that whole thing shifts after a, a certain amount of time. And it's shifting again, it's shifting again, it's shifting again. It's propagating, we'll say, from left to right. Good so far? So now let's think about this. So we have our magnetic field, it's propagating. Uh, so I'll put B here to represent the magnetic field. And why don't we go ahead, I'll put V in here just to say that it's propagating. Incidentally, you notice that this is a transverse wave. The magnetic field is perpendicular to the direction of propagation. Right. That's that's what a transverse wave is. The direction of propagation is perpendicular to the direction that the particles move, or the magnetic field is. So if you're thinking water, water molecules go up and down, but the wave travels perpendicular to that direction. Okay, so there's that. So let's uh, let's add another little piece in here now. Okay. I'm going to add a loop of wire in here. Uh, let's do it in some darker color, which hopefully gives us a little bit of contrast. I'm going to add a wire in here. Now, I need for this wire, the wave is traveling up and down. Okay, I want the wire to be like this. Okay. So the wave's going this way, up and down. I want the wire to be located like this. Now, I don't know if I can actually draw that in very well, but something like... I'll have my loop of, well, I say loop, I'll, I, I called it wire, but I'll, so I want my wire to be like that. So as this wave propagates, the magnetic field will start doing a flux through that loop. And that's why I want it like that. And that, this is gonna be a very special type of wire. This is going to not be a wire made out of copper. It's not going to be a wire made out of gold or aluminum or platinum or anything. I'm going to choose a very special material. I'm going to make this wire out of empty space. All right? I think I made that, that comment at one point. The hardest wire to conceptualize is the wire made out of nothing. Of course, nothing is still a material. Seems kind of weird to think about, but. Empty space is still a type of material. 
It doesn't react chemically to anything, so that's kind of boring, because chemistry is all about what electrons, all right? I mean, essentially, chemistry is about electrons. You can't do chemistry on empty space, because empty space doesn't have any electrons, so it's, it's kind of boring. But you can do physics on empty space. So I'm going to make this wire out of a very special material, nothing. It's a wire made out of nothing. And of course, you notice that as this wave propagates from left to right, I'm going to start having a changing flux through that loop of nothing. And what does Faraday's law tell me? If I have a changing flux through that loop, what does Faraday's law tell me? Say the flux starts to increase through that loop. What does Faraday's law say? The induced field will oppose it. In other words, as, say, this region, let's say we're right here. Say this part of my field, right, this wave is traveling along. Let's say that, air, that region of this traveling wave is now hitting my loop. So you notice that as it propagates, the magnetic flux is increasing through that loop. So it will want to run a current to oppose that increasing change, or that increasing flux, excuse me. Now granted, it's, it's, it's a wire made out of nothing, so you don't see electrons running around, but there still is an electric field there. The electric field is there, there's just nothing there to respond to the electric field. You can create an electric field and not have current, in other words. Is that okay? Right, the electric field doesn't mean you have a current. Right? If you have an electric field inside a conductor, then you'll get current moving, right? There's, there's electrons, they wanna move easily, so then you'll get, so the electric field is still being generated, it's just there's no current flowing because there's no charges that can move. So, for example, in this loop, if the magnetic field flux is increasing, you know, say B, B net is increasing, uh, let's see, we could apply Faraday's law. The flux through the loop is increasing, which means that I have an, ex, uh, an induced field that's pointing down, and that will tell me that momentarily that the electric field should be running that way around the loop. Oh, and incidentally, this it would be into the board on the left-hand side and coming out of the board on the right-hand side. Sorry, those arrows are kind of bad, but. Is that okay so far? Right now we're doing Faraday's law. You know, okay, great. You you're beating a dead horse on Faraday's law. Okay. Next question. So I've done it for a particular part of this traveling wave. What happens to the direction that the electric field runs? I've drawn it for one particular situation. What would happen when this piece starts going through the wave? or it starts uh, penetrating the loop. So this left piece now, what happens to the direction of the electric field running around that loop? Instead of the flux of the magnetic field increasing, the flux is now decreasing, right? The magnetic field strength is dropping. That means the flux is decreasing. That means the induced field will want to oppose that decrease. And so the electric field will start running the opposite way. And I'll keep going. As this wave continues propagating, eventually the electric field will run one way. 
Then I'll start running the opposite way. Then I'll run the other way, and I'll keep changing directions every once in a while. Yay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to focus now. Okay, so we've got that. Let's set that off to the side. I'm going to focus now. I mean, essentially what you have is that you periodically get electric fields coming out of the board at you and then going into the board and out of the board and into the board and out of the board and into the board. Right? Because you have this magnetic field propagating through space going up down, it generates an electric field that's going out of the board and then coming into the board and then going out of the board and going into the board and out of the board and back and forth. So let me write, let me, let's now do that. So, so because of this propagating magnetic field, I'll put V here again. Now, because of this propagating magnetic field, let's see, when it's dropping, the electric field, let's take this piece, it's coming out of the board. Okay. Shoot, I got to think about how to draw this. Out of the board and then into the, is that right? Okay. Well, let me draw it like this. Instead of up and down, I'm going to try to draw it out of the page and into the page out of the page and into the page that just looks the exact same doesn't it i mean for this instead of it being up and down like up and down i mean for it to be out of the page and into the page and then back out of the page and back into the page something like that I, i'm sorry i know that doesn't look most of the time you just draw them on top of each other, right? The magnetic field's going one way, the electric field's going another way. Um, I'll see if I can find a figure for you. Yay, nay. I know it's a terrible picture. Do you kind of see what I'm trying to draw here? So that's the big thing. Yeah. So because this magnetic field is propagating, going to the right and it is you know varying up and down you generate an electric field that's going in and out of the page per faraday's law and yes indeed it turns out to be sinusoidal in fact i think i showed you that right i showed you that if the flux varies according to cosine the emf varies as a sine sinusoidally Right, the spinning loop in the magnetic field. It, it's a slightly different situation. The, I'm, I did a spinning loop in a magnetic field, but you could have just said, keep the loop stationary and vary the magnetic field according to a cosine. And you'll get the same result. The EMF is sinusoidal. Oh, we're gonna have to latch onto that. I just, I just came up with this wonderful idea. Okay, so, so the EMF is sinusoidal. Now I'm going to use this, this, we're going to use this idea that Maxwell came up with. A changing flux of the electric field generates a magnetic field. Now we won't have to, we won't go through like, you notice for example, there's no negative sign. So there's no, there's no lenses law for the Maxwell correction. And in fact, we're not going to do very much with it. I just want to give you a heuristic argument that, uh, let's go green here. So now if I think about a loop of nothing that's oriented like, not like this, that was the, the, the loop of nothing that experienced the magnetic flux. I wanna think of our loop of nothing as being like this. So that as the electric field goes in, in and out of the board, it gives you a flux through that, that piece now, that green loop. 
Faraday said that a change in magnetic flux will generate an electric field. Ampere says a change in electric field will generate a magnetic field. So in other words, as this electric field, you can imagine the same region of space, this is the electric field. As that electric field starts propagating through this loop, giving us a change in flux, what ends up happening is that a magnetic field will be generated. And that's, I'm just using this to, to indicate the magnetic field. In other words, as the electric field starts going in and out of that loop, experiencing a change in flux, you'll generate a magnetic field going up and down. Is that okay? That's like real deep water that we're just treading on. I want to make sure that you kind of get the heuristic idea. So how does that relate to like magnetic field creating current? What would the electric field create in like something like that? I know it's not like current. Yeah, I mean, um, that's that's where it kind of gets uh, it, it gets weird. I, I shouldn't say weird. Because, I, I mean, really, the, the issue is that uh, charges can be separated. You can get... So, with the electric field, we can talk about currents, because you can separate charges, and a current is just simply one charge moving a certain direction. For the magnetic field, we can't separate those north and south poles. Right? If we could, then you could think of a magnetic you know, north poles running one way and forming a current and south poles going the other way and forming a current. But that you can't separate north poles from south poles. Uh, I think the easiest, maybe the easiest way to think about this is if you put a compass at that location in space, what would the compass be doing? Right, flipping back and forth. As, as this magnetic field gets generated, the compass will be pointing one way and then it'll flip the other way, then it'll flip back and then it'll flip back and it'll, flip, it'll keep going back and forth. So that's what I would think of as a magnetic current. It's that if you put a compass there, it's not that the compass actually moves in some direction, translates, but rather the compass, you could see if you can watch the needle flip back and forth. I don't know if that, if that helps or not, but... Okay, yeah, that's what I think of is put a compass there, you'd watch it flip back and forth periodically, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Other questions? This takes us back. Uh, this takes us. Uh, this takes us on a great debate between something like 1880s and 1905. Because right. one of the one of the issues about light is what is the nature of light, and another thing is how does light propagate? How does light? from the sun that's 93 million miles away actually get here to the earth? Right. Or how does light from the Andromeda galaxy that's what, 2.5 million light years away actually get to earth? Because we know that there's not any, I mean, nowadays we know there's nothing in between, right? There's, I mean, by and large, most of the distance to the Andromeda galaxy is empty space, void of nothing, or void of, I said void of nothing should be void of everything, right? Empty space, uh, on average, there's about one hydrogen molecule per cubic meter of space, which is basically empty, right? Like one, one hydrogen atom per a cubic meter. Right? So the question, one of the, one of the great debates 
was, you know, how does light actually travel through what we now know as empty space? Well, originally, scientists in the early 1900s said that space isn't empty. There's something called ether. There's this material called ether through which light propagates. That was one going theory. That there's a medium through which light propagates. And we just haven't been creative enough to find that medium yet. So it's called ether. And scientists for 20 or 30 years were trying to figure out what is ether made out of? Which direction is ether moving? Yada, yada, yada. Now, in contrast to that, you have Maxwell's equations, which basically say, Do you need a material in order for light to propagate? Do you need a, excuse me, I should say, do you need a material in order for an electromagnetic wave to propagate? Survey says, no, the simple fact that you have a changing magnetic field generates a changing electric field, which generates a changing magnetic field, right? I, that's the piece that I forgot to loop in changing magnetic field, that changing magnetic field generates you got a changing magnetic field which generates a changing electric field, the changing electric field generates a changing magnetic field which generates a changing electric field, which generates a changing magnetic field, which generates a changing, you see what's going on here, they loop back on each other the changing magnetic field generates the changing electric field, which changes the magnetic field, which changes the electric field, which changes the magnetic field, yada, yada, yada. That's how we perceive light moving through space. Is that the change in one of the fields automatically causes a change in the other field. And those two changes build on each other and keep the light, you know, keep that wave of light moving through space. You don't need the medium anymore. Oh, uh, uh, shoot, let me think here. Speed is light times frequency. And you know that the amplitude of the wave is proportional to frequency. Yeah. I didn't mean to do this, but you guys, I, I, I keep affirming that it's light, but I mean, maybe maybe I should go through and just prove to you that it is light. You, you'll have to tell me if I've gone off the deep end. You ready for it? I think we I think I think I'm going to I'm going to bank on. Oh, man, I'm so glad I did that Excel thing now. Because I think I, I can, I'm going to refer to the Excel thing and hopefully use that as a heuristic argument. Heuristic argument, sorry, appeals to the heuristic, not a formal proof, but rather a proof appealing to the senses. So I'll say, well, hopefully this makes sense to you. And go, okay, yeah, that makes sense, and then and then we do it that way. That's not a formal proof, right? That's not like math proof or anything. Do you remember, um, I, I think this will work. When we had the changing magnetic field and we looked at the EMF, do you remember how the amplitude of the EMF changed? Right, the amplitude of the EMF, the back field was proportional to the frequency of the wave. Do I still have it? <gasps> I might have it. Let me let me just let me open up Excel and see if I actually saved it. I would feel like a boss if I actually did. Guess what? I didn't. Oh, that's sad. Oh, that's sad. Well, you have to yell at your professor for not not. Do you, do you remember the, the the cosine and the the sine? I'm just going to bank on that. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I should have written it down. Yeah, so if we had something like the magnetic field goes oscillates at cosine of omega t, 
then we found that the EMF basically was omega sine of omega t. And I think this will be good enough for us to go through. I feel like there's one thing that's missing here. Now we'll figure it out. Is that, is that okay? What do you think would happen if I looked at the change in sine of omega t? What do you think I would get? If I looked at the change of cosine omega t and I get sine, what do you think I would get if I looked at the change in sine? I get cosine. Yeah. Turns out if I look at the change of cosine, I got, I got sine. If I look at the change of sine, I get cosine. Okay. And in fact, I would get something like, if I look at omega sine of omega t, I would get omega squared cosine of omega t. Like that. Uh, so the amplitude, uh, the amplitude varies a little bit. Oh shoot, what do I want to do here? I wanted to relate Ampere's law to omega. I think I've got that. There's something missing here. There's an angular frequency. How do I get a speed? I gotta multiply by a wavelength, don't I? If I have angular frequency and I multiply by a wavelength, oh, the wave number, if I multiply by the wave number, then I can get the speed of the wave. Nuts. I'm missing something. Okay. I'm like that close. Sorry, I'm missing something there. I get a squared out in front, is the thing I was thinking about. Um, shoot, nope, I'm missing something. Sorry, guys. What I was thinking is that this is given by mu naught on mu naught on epsilon naught is is what I was thinking, but I'm I'm a little bit off there. So okay, so scrap that. My apologies. I was thinking of one thing and I can't do it. So scrap that idea. The general idea still holds. Was that we have a way of understanding how an electromagnetic wave can propagate through space. The connection of why we call light an electromagnetic wave comes back to that coefficient in Ampere's law. Or excuse me, Maxwell's, Maxwell's correction. Right? Maxwell said a changing electric flux will generate a magnetic field. And unlike Faraday's law, it did not have a negative sign, but also unlike Faraday's law, it had that mu naught epsilon naught out in front. So I won't, I'm sorry, I was gonna derive it and then I realized that I'm not in the position to derive it. I'm missing something here. So I'm not in the position to derive it. But what I will say is this, how do they make the connection at the end of the day? How did they make the connection that an electromagnetic field is actually light? And the connection comes in right here. That one over mu naught epsilon naught that came in from Maxwell's correction. I put a square root in, I'll leave it out actually. That one over mu naught epsilon naught that comes in from Maxwell's correction. They actually find that that matches the speed of light squared, which is why Maxwell gets all the credit. It's because without that Maxwellian correction, you wouldn't realize that that mu naught epsilon naught is important, and then you wouldn't be able to make the connection with the speed of light. Sorry, I stopped by the office, but I got to drop a derivative in order to do it right. So you'll have to, if you want to see it, stop by the office and I'll do it. But I realize now I can't actually show you. This, of course, means that they're OK. Questions so far? Sorry, I boggled that for a second.
The, the thing I like to think about is uh, this means that you have to have an idea about what the speed of light is first. Right? Maxwell comes through in the 1880s and says, okay, I've got this weird thing where a, mag a change in magnetic field causes a change in electric field. And I actually have this mu naught epsilon naught. And if I look at it very carefully, I realize that it's the speed of light squared. And there's the where people start saying, well, this can't be by accident. Maybe light is actually an electromagnetic wave. But to really make that connection, you have to know what the speed of light is first. So I always like to think about how did people actually get the speed of light? How do you actually get the speed of light? How do you, this is the 1880s or so. Like how did people back in 150 years ago have a good estimation for the speed of light? Can I talk about it? It's really cool with like experimental measurements. Okay, good. No, actually, actually, it's not too bad. It's not, it seems bad. Actually, Galileo had an experiment to measure the speed of light. And he had the right idea. So imagine Galileo, he says, okay, here's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna take two people with lamps. So each of you get a lamp. No flashlights, no lasers, you get a lamp. You are gonna take your lamp as far away on the top of that mountain. Okay. And we can measure that. Like you're walking, you're gonna pace it off. One meter, two meters, three meters. So we're gonna pace off how far away you are. So the step one, two people, we know how far apart they are. Okay. Here's what we're gonna do. Here's the experiment. Once you're far enough away, you still have to be able to see my lamp. Yeah, that's the big thing. So I, I keep my lamp off and you walk away and you double check to see if you can see the lamp. Okay. When you're in a position where you're far enough away and you can't see my lamp, or you're right on that edge of being able to discern it, you're going to lift up your lamp and uncover it. Okay. So that way I can see you, you can see me. Okay. Now we're going to cover our lamps. Good so far? We know the distance, we know that each other can see each other. Now here's the experiment Galileo proposed. What is going to happen? I am going to uncover my lamp. You, when you see that my lamp is uncovered, you will uncover your lamp. And then when I see that your lamp is uncovered, we'll stop our watch. So I'm standing here, I say, go, stop, right? I uncover my, I yell go and I uncover my lamp so that my timer starts keeping time. And when I see that you've uncovered your lamp, I'll hit stop. I'll, start, I'll yell stop. And we know that the speed of light must be then the distance between the two people, right? Lamp one and lamp two. We know this distance. I know, okay, I uncover my lamp and the light comes over. You uncover your lamp and the light comes back and I yell stop. So now I have an idea about the distance between us because you counted your paces. Or maybe I just get my long tape measure and I just measure it, but we can get that distance. And I can look over at the person recording the time and saying, how long did it take? Boom, we've got a measurement of the speed of light. Twice the distance divided by the time, that's how fast light must travel. And literally, that, that, um, that proposal to measure the speed of light is what was done in the 1800s. That was essentially the same experiment that was done in the 1800s. The reason that Galileo couldn't come up with it, you probably already know. I heard somebody say, do you really have that accurate of a watch? No, that's the problem, is that this experiment hypothetically would work out. The problem is, is that when Galileo uncovers his lamp and yells go, he almost immediately has to yell stop. Right? In fact, the speed of light is so fast that the main, the main thing that takes time is the person's reaction. 
So this experiment, you could say this experiment would set a lower limit to how fast the speed of light is. So they could say, okay, well, we can't measure the speed of light, but we could say that the speed of light has to be greater than 15 meters per second, or you know, you know some, some value. It's probably closer to like uh, 300 meters per second. So you could say what it was, but you could say what it definitely had to be over. The issue was that Galileo just didn't have a good enough watch. And it wasn't like, uh, you know, the, like I said, the reaction time was the bigger problem there. But the general idea still holds. We fast forward now. Um, shoot. Uh, so, so Galileo had the right idea. There's another. There's another. I think it's oil Romer. O L E, and then there's an add a slash through the O. And Romer. Uh, shoot, I don't remember if there's an umlaut over the O or not. And you have to forgive me. I have no idea what the nationality is. European. Oil Romer was, uh, he was very interested in uh, the moons of Jupiter. And I don't know if you're familiar with the Galilean moons of Jupiter. Uh, Europa, Io, Ganymede, and Castillo. Uh, and so he was observing the moons orbiting Jupiter, night after night after night. And uh, there was this newfangled invention. Well, okay, you've got the telescope. There's these newfangled ideas called gravity coming from Newton's laws. And so what Oil Romer was doing was he was comparing his calculations using Newton's law of gravity to his observations. According to his calculations, he could predict when Io should come out from behind Jupiter. So he calculated out, he said, okay, at 8.37 tonight, Io should emerge from behind Jupiter. So he'd be sitting and watching and watch Io come out from behind Jupiter, according to his watch, and look at it on his watch. Okay. So this is basically what, what Romer's doing. Okay. There's some other reasons why they thought about using Io as a universal clock. So he's studying it for a couple of other reasons. But, uh, but it turns out that his calculations, according to Newton's laws, didn't quite match his observations. And he found this a little bit weird. And it turns out that uh, he found that his calculations tended to be better when Jupiter was close to Earth. He found out that his calculations tended to be very far off from his observations when the distance between Earth and Jupiter was particularly large. Okay. So let me draw, I mean, uh, and you'll have to yell at me if, if this is boring, just let me know. I mean, I find it exciting because this is how, you know, science is done. Uh, but uh, yeah, so, uh, so you have the sun, you have the earth, and you have Jupiter. And when earth and Jupiter are close together on the same side of their orbits, he found that the discrepancy was fairly small. When they're on opposite sides of the orbit, say earth is here, and Jupiter is over here, he found the discrepancy to be rather large. And it turns out the discrepancy, okay, let me think about this for a second. Uh, let's see, this is eight, and that's four and a half, so this is like 32, so this is like 36 plus another eight, about 40, okay, gotcha. Um, yeah, I think it's about 40, so it must be yeah, something like 40. Okay, so and I, I, I'm just thinking of the discrepancy in my head. I think he got a discrepancy as large as like 40 minutes. Okay. Something, something like that, which is fairly large, right? Like, why am I getting that large of a discrepancy? Now, the, the issue is, oil roamer and pretty much everybody at the time thought that the speed of light was instantaneous. In other words, light immediately, instantaneously travels from the sun, hits Jupiter, and travels back to Earth. It's instantaneous. Okay. Oil Romer recognized that, hey, my calculations don't match up with my observations. He actually recorded the differences. Uh, what he did not realize is that those differences are due to the fact that light has to travel a longer distance. 
for this, for this orientation, light has to travel um, about, let's see, what's three and a half times eight? Uh, 24, 28. Okay. What he didn't realize is that in this, when it's in this orientation, it takes 28 minutes for light to travel from Jupiter back to Earth. Okay. It's about 3.5 astronomical units. Uh, let's see, uh, that's about 300 million miles. So it takes light about 20 minutes to travel 300 million miles. Ballparkish. Okay. Now in this orientation, it takes light almost, let's see, this is, uh, so this is three and a half, so this is five and a half, so five and a half times eight is 44 minutes. In this orientation, it takes about 44 minutes to travel that distance. So you see there's a discrepancy, I mean, 28 minutes versus 44, okay, so there's about 26 minutes difference there. Wait, four, 16 minutes difference, excuse me. So what, I mean, so first of all, he notices that, hey, my calculations are always off by about 24 minutes at the low side, at the high side, about 44 minutes. So there's a discrepancy of about 16 minutes there. What he did not realize is that that discrepancy was caused by the distance to Jupiter. So he actually had the data that he needed in order to find the speed of light. He just didn't realize that he had it. In fact, if you know the distance to Jupiter, you can figure out the speed of light from this. So oil roamer, and, and yes, indeed, people went back and actually realized later that, hey, wait a minute, there's this, these calculations that Romer did based on the timing of Io coming out from behind Jupiter. And he commented about this discrepancy. And in fact, that's why they said, OK, Io isn't a good clock. They wanted to use Io to establish a universal time. They said, oh, it's not a good clock because it doesn't, it seems to drift. Sometimes it comes out earlier than it should. Sometimes it comes out later than it should. So this is not a good clock. It wasn't until later that they realized, OK, yes. So you notice this one, they have a long enough ruler, right? The problem with Galileo's measurements is that the people are so close together that there's very little time to react. Here, there's a long distance for light to travel, and it's just that we didn't realize that that was, you know, what was actually going on there. There's another issue of we didn't actually know how far it was to Jupiter. So there, you have to get that measurement taken care of too. So uh, now we fast forward to, uh, two gentlemen in Paris in the 1850s. One's known as Foucault, and, uh, yeah, Foucault and Fizeau. So I got a, so French is always nasty, right? I think one of them is Fizeau, right? There's an E-A-U and the other one is Foucault. Fo I think it's Foucault. I think there's a Foucault and Fizeau. And, and then they're working together in Paris in the 1850s. Eventually, they, there's some sort of falling out and they become rival scientists. And so it's one of those that original, originally, excuse me, they're after the speed of light measurement. And uh, I, I don't know what happened, but eventually it was Fizeau would do a measurement and say, I mean, literally publish his results and say, and by the way, this is 3% more precise than Foucault's measurements. And then Foucault would do a measurement and write in, you know, and oh, by the way, this is 10% more precise than Fizeau's measurements. And it was kind of, it was one of those kind of things. So I, I don't remember which one did what or what, you know, whatever. Okay? But their basic idea was the same. They set up a lamp uh, in Paris. And if you've ever been to Paris, there's like Sacre Coeur, the, the Catholic church that's on a hill in Paris. It's in the Montmartre district, which is also where the Moulin Rouge is. Okay. So if you ever want to walk around, it's, it's, it's kind of a nice place to visit at night. Just don't take your personal belongings with you. Like but when I go, when, I mean, it, it's fairly safe, but like when I go there, I like, I don't take your camera, don't take money. Just, you know, put your, put your hotel key in your wallet and, you know, in your back pocket. Don't even bring your wallet. Just walk around and enjoy the scenes. Don't worry about taking pictures. So, um, so in any case, it's in the Montmartre district, and uh, they set up a mirror on Montmartre. They set up their lamp at their home laboratory that's about 12 kilometers away. Okay. 
And it's the same idea that Galileo had. We are going to uncover the lamp, let the light reflect off the mirror, and come back. And we know how far away it is. Now, how did they improve their timing mechanism? Same idea. The only thing that they changed was, OK, you have a mirror. It's 12 kilometers away. What they did, I'll draw it as a hexagon. OK, that's a terrible hexagon because I can't draw right. I'll draw it as a hexagon. What they did was they took a six sided mirror. And they spun it. Say, so why, why is that? Let me let me give you the rest of the experiment. So what they did was they put their lamp right here. Okay? Their lamp right here and the light from the lamp would strike their six sided mirror. That light would be reflected 12 kilometers away to the mirror that's on Mamata. It would reflect back. It would reflect back, strike another side of the mirror, the rotating mirror, and go into, I'll call it their detector, like their eye. Following me so far? Now here's the stroke of genius. And here's really where it goes beyond what Galileo was thinking. I said this mirror rotates. They can control how fast that rotates, the angular speed. And you can make it rotate faster, make it rotate slower. And here's, here's the, like I said, the stroke of genius. Only when it's rotating at the right speed will you be able to see light going back into your eye. Right? Imagine for a second, if it's rotating too slow, then this, this mirror is not prop. Oh, excuse me. I should say, as the light travels down, strikes the mirror and travels back, this surface is rotating over to the next position. So only when that rotation of the mirror is the right speed, Will you actually see the reflected light going into your eye? If it moves too slow, sorry, that's just a jumbled mess, isn't it? If it moves too slow, then the light gets reflected somewhere else where you're not standing. If it moves too fast, then maybe it gets reflected off to this side. It's only when it's moving at the exact right rate will you actually see that light you know, in the, you know, the reflection. Yay, nay, do you kind of see how that works? And oh, by the way, if you use a six sided mirror, you know how fast it's spinning. Besides, I know how far it has to rotate so I can find how, what, how the timing, how long it took to rotate that distance. So that's how instead of doing a stopwatch, go, stop, right? They use the fact that, okay, I can see the reflected beam now. And I know how fast the mirror is spinning. If you increase the number of sides of the mirror, you can get a more accurate time measurement, right? Smaller angle deflections and all that kind of jazz. So by the 1850s, they knew the speed of light down to like 10% of the accepted value. And basically, Foucault and Fizeau, they continued working on this mechanism. Um, they eventually changed it into, instead of a spinning mirror. It was two cogs, two gears that were spinning at slightly different rates. Okay. And if light could pass through the teeth of both gears, reflect off of the distant mirror and come back through a second set of teeth, then, then that's, it was the same idea. And so you rotate this thing at a certain rate, it goes out through one, the, the teeth rotate, it comes in in the next one. You know how many teeth are on your gear, so you can say how quickly the gear is turned, and then, and then you can get your timing measurement that way. Um, it just allowed them to do finer and finer divisions. The basic idea stayed the same. So by the 1850s or so, we know the speed of light to about 10%. By the 1890s or so, where you've got it down to like 2% of the accepted value. 
So that when Maxwell comes in, he says, hey, this mu naught epsilon naught is this value, which is the speed of light squared. And that's where the connection gets made, is they go, well, wait a minute, maybe this electromagnetic stuff that we've been dealing with is actually what light is. Which takes us on to a whole new path. Yay, yay. That's pretty much all I have to say about that. That's, the, that's just the general overview of the nature of light. Um, so uh, what, what we'll pass into now is uh, how do you manipulate light? So this is the, you know, whatever, however far we get in the rest of the, the, the rest of the term, um, we're going to look at how to manipulate light. And by manipulate, I mean, how can we focus light? And you can do it through basically two ways. You can use mirrors and you can use lenses. So that will bring us into a field that's called geometric optics, using mirrors and lenses to focus light. If we get lucky, which I don't know if you're feeling that punkish or not, right? My, my guess is we probably won't get to it, but there's also a, a branch called physical optics. And physical optics is again talking about the electric field and the idea that the electric field can superimpose. You can take two beams of light, superimpose them, and if the electric field, the wave of the electric field is perfectly out of phase, you can get no light. You can get the two electric fields to superimpose so that the overall electric field is zero. And if you don't have an electric field, you don't have any light anymore. That is called physical optics, where you'll run into things like Michelson-Morley apparatus, or you'll hear terms like LIGO, interferometry. Do you guys deal with interferometry? Using light to measure distances. Or uh, have you done, uh, let's see, I guess maybe laser cooling, Doppler cooling? Yes. Okay, no, shoot, nuts. Okay, so maybe physical optics isn't that important to you. Yeah. I don't know, if you're not running across it, then maybe, but geometric optics should be. So that's where we'll go, is that we've got the nature of light taken care of, how do you get the speed of light? Um, so we'll go there, is how do you focus light? lenses, mirrors, and we'll we'll play around with that stuff for the next couple weeks probably. Maybe I'll drop LIGO on you just to see if you like get excited about you know billion dollar machines in, in Louisiana and Washington. Black hole detectors? Have you heard LIGO? Laser Interferometer Gravitational Observatory. Oh he, oh you guys should look they measure distances to a precision of less than the width of a proton, which is pretty cool. All right. Hey, thanks for your attention. Get out of here. I'll see you Monday, if you, unless you have questions. And you're like, let me, you're like, get me out of here. Okay, that's fine. Yeah, yeah, get out of here. Yeah, yeah. What's up?